David Cowan. I'm president of the museum, and uh, thank you for joining us in spite of the nor'easter that uh, hit us today. We're the only public museum uh, in our nation dedicated to the financial world and the capital markets. We're a 501c3 and a Smithsonian uh, affiliate. Our core mission is to preserve exhibit and educate about our nation's finances and financial history. And tonight we're going to get some education about 21st century banking and bridging the digital divide. If this is your first visit to the museum, uh, please afterwards during the reception take a look at the exhibits, come back during our regular hours, or check us out on the website uh, where you'll find out about upcoming events. Uh, we want to thank our program sponsors, uh, Ally Financial and FIS Capco, both good friends of the museum. And then a special thank you to our sponsor for the afterward festivities, the reception, Protivity, also good uh, friends of the museum, and our board member, Corey Gunderson. Now, I do have one regret tonight, and that is from uh, Diane Moray, and she's uh, the CEO of Ally Bank, and she unfortunately is unable to make it. Her flight was canceled. Uh, we do have strong Ally representation in the room, but uh, be that as it may, I'll be pinch hitting uh, for her for the opening comments. Now, we've been discussing this topic at our Communications Executives Advisory Panel for over a year. That panel is comprised of industry executives, fintech comms people, Esther's here, I see, um, and it's really relevant to them, and they brought it to the fore, so we're excited to bring you this program. I want to thank our speakers uh, for making it in tonight. Some came from just around the block, some came from around the country, and one actually came from halfway around the world, so we're very appreciative that they did um, make it here. And these speakers represent the cutting edge thinking in banking and fintech. So we really are excited to hear what they have to say. Our panel is going to start with a fireside uh, chat with Ally CIO, CIO Michael Barisic, who is here, and our program moderator, John Steinberg, who is founder and CEO of Cheddar and formerly a president of BuzzFeed. Uh, next, we will have a panel of experts. Their full bios are on your seats. Um, but uh, Tariq, or Tark, I'm sorry, Tark Barkari is Head of Innovation and Investment at FIS. Maria Gotch is President and CEO of the Partnership Fund for NYC. And David Sosna is Co-Founder and CEO of Personetics. Now, banking is close to my heart. First of all, this museum is in a former banking hall. It's the former headquarters of the Bank of New York. And then right next door to us some 200 years ago, was the first bank of the United States branch. Uh, it was the first quasi-central bank in America. The cornerstone is still there. And this grand uh, building was built before FDIC insurance, and therefore you had to look very impressive because the only thing standing behind you and your deposits were the full faith and credit of the bank. And then during my college summer intern years, I was a bank teller and then eventually worked on the trading floors of several large commercial banks. Now, several decades ago when I was involved, there were some 14,000 banks. Uh, two decades later, we're about half that number. We've seen a huge consolidation in the industry. We still have though $11.5 trillion worth of deposits in the banking industry, so uh, that amounts to an enormous amount of trust that the public is putting into the banking system. Uh, there is a big banking revolution going on right in front of our eyes, this huge migration to online banking. Uh, to varying degrees, all bank customers now and consumers are using the online facilities, whether it's wholly an online bank or even if they're involved in the traditional brick and mortar institution. And it's not just uh, you're checking your account balance. We are now with keystrokes, opening accounts, making deposits, making withdrawals, making transfers. Even when you're at dinner now with a friend, you can just take on your phone and transfer money over to him to split the bill. So how is the industry bridging this divide? How are the traditional and non-traditional financial service companies moving into FinTech? That's what we came to hear tonight. Well, it's always a pleasure being here, and Michael, thank you for joining uh, this evening. Um, My pleasure to be here, and thank you to all of you for coming out in the inclement weather. I can't believe anybody's here, to be honest. <laughs> um, my favorite part of the museum is this area over here, which I think, to what David opened with, where you see this kind of, the original ticker machine, uh, the ticker tape, and then it goes all the way through to the Bloomberg Terminal. And it's, it's amazing to see that kind of uh, change. And one of the many differences between John and myself is that I've actually used a Quotron. Yeah. I, I, one of my uh, friend's father's offices, I saw one at one point. <laughs> Don't rub it in. Um, 
but Michael, let's, I wasn't going to start here, but David's comments where he began with this being a beautiful and stunning high ceiling uh, bank, and, and you work for a beautiful and stunning and amazing bank, but there is no bank. Um, and you did that really kind of before technology got roaring quite to the level that we're at now. Um, so, so talk us through that. Talk us through how that works and why Ally is, was sort of branchless before it even became a thing to be branchless. Yeah, I was reflecting on that on the way over here as I was walking down uh, Wall Street, which is now, of course, a pedestrian mall. When I worked down here initially, there were actually cars and trucks and so on. But one of my early jobs was at 16 Wall, uh, which was the old Bankers Trust building. And we had a beautiful uh, sort of lobby uh, uh, area like this one. And as I walked past it, it's now an Equinox gym. And so it just got me thinking about what will all the branches be when they grow up, and maybe they'll all be Equinox gyms. Uh, but in our case, uh, you know, we're talking a lot about disruption tonight. We, we kind of think of ourselves as one of the original disruptors. As we brought up our bank, uh, we were born in the digital space uh, and had no uh, brick and mortar, and to this day have no brick and mortar uh, for, for banking. And so for us, uh, it was a matter of how could we do something that felt different to the marketplace, that we could bring up quickly, that enabled us to be uh, perhaps more nimble uh, than we would otherwise be if we were uh, encumbered by a, a, a branch network. Uh, and uh, I see some, some other competitors of ours that have brought up online banks have since gone into the uh, branch banking business. Uh, but for us, we think the digital space is, is where it's at for us. Uh, and in fact, uh, in really all of our businesses where you know, we have kind of the, the killer app in uh, online banking, but also our auto finance business, uh, virtually all of our transactions are done digitally. So it's a space that we're comfortable in, but it does put certain pressures on us with respect to how we interact with our customers to make sure we have that fulsome experience uh, that they would otherwise get walking into a uh, a room like this one. And then to step back a bit and to kind of begin with what was going to be my, my beginning question, and you and I talked about this when we met a few weeks back, what uh, the, the CIO role across companies is so different and the CIO role across um, financial services companies is so different. You've been in the job for many years. How has the role changed and what is the core of your role now? Uh, you know, I, th I think uh, not just for myself, but for uh, many people in my position, if you turn back the clock 10, 15 years, uh, it was more about keeping the factory running. Uh, and the innovation uh, tended to be done by so-called front office people. Uh, I've never recognized any of those distinctions between front office and back office, having done uh, uh, lots of jobs on both sides of that uh, permeable, in my mind, permeable barrier. Uh, and, but if you fast forward to today, uh, the job's completely different. I, I don't know any CIO that's not involved in the, uh, the future of their company in terms of the products and services and the way they go to market, uh, because there are very few companies I can think of uh, that are not technology companies in, in sheep's clothing. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, when I arrived at Ally about five years ago, uh, I walked around saying that we were a technology company, and you know that was kind of considered uh, was I grandstanding? Was that yeah. hyperbole? Uh, and now, uh, Goldman Sachs calls themselves that. Almost everybody calls themselves that. And uh, it, it's really just a recognition of the fact that uh, you know, even if you are in the brick and mortar business, technology is underlying the whole uh, set of products and services that you're providing. In financial I want to services. probe on that comment that you made that you've never really seen a difference between front and back office. And surprisingly, this has been an industry where there has been a huge distinction and almost a class structure between back and front office. I, you know, I've been with two financial services clients in the past week, both of which bemoaning how bad their consumer-facing software was. It's shocking how many financial services companies still have bad software. As I look over there and I see the Bloomberg terminal, and I was just reading a quote from Mayor Bloomberg this past week where he talked about being demoted into the back office. Bloomberg got demoted to working in technology, which is why that's there, and he's a billionaire, and he's a mayor three times over. Um, why did that happen in this industry? Um, is it being corrected? And, and have you seen, you know, have you seen now it, it, that, that your sentiment change across the whole industry or, or, or not so much? 
Yeah, I, I, I think it's really the tide has turned on that. You know, when I started in financial services in the mid 80s, we were still sending securities around in pneumatic tubes, literally in pneumatic tubes uh, between floors and so on. Uh, uh, Ginny Mays were settled uh, physically with uh, messengers going back and forth to windows and so on. And so I, I think when you had that sort of a, a gritty physical environment, uh, the sense was there were a whole class of jobs that could be done by people who were uh, potentially less educated, often uh, at a lower rung on the socioeconomic ladder, let's, let's face it. Uh, so, you know, if you were uh, you know, from one of the outer boroughs and high school educated, you worked with the met pneumatic tubes, and right. if you were a fancy Ivy League educated individual, you got a so-called front office job. Uh, you know, the, the, the gritty physicality of the business has changed so dramatically just in, in my lifetime uh, that y you can't even imagine that there are that level of, uh, you know, distinction between front office and back office jobs, and I think there's a recognition now, and it happened really uh, as trading strategies became more algorithmic, uh, algorithmic, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and programming uh, sort of was something that front office people began to do, and that just created a revolution in which people understood that, uh, you know, you can do things with software uh, that uh, prior were done, you know, through very uh, cumbersome manual processes. And how much do you think of, of being in Detroit, uh, coming out of auto finance, um, as opposed to coming out of New York, and we'll, we'll bring Maria into this conversation a bit about New York. Whenever I see the Ally story, I think about Walmart. Why is Walmart different? It's in Bentonville. They weren't. They were able to have their own thinking. They came at it from a different angle. Um, how much of Ally being this technology company is driven by the fact that it wasn't in New York and it was sort of left on an island to figure it out? Um, I think it's really more the fact that Ally's kind of a virtual company. So. Uh, the Detroit connection uh, is certainly true with respect to our legacy auto finance business, uh, but the online bank was born sort of somewhere in the space between Charlotte and New York, uh, and our center of gravity has moved between uh, Charlotte, New York, and Detroit. So um, I don't think it's so much that we were out of New York as it was that we as a company didn't think of ourselves as wedded to any particular physical presence. And of course, uh, as we got deeper into digital financial services, we were everywhere. And so uh, outside reflected inside, inside reflected outside with respect to corporate uh, structure as well as the way we, we went to